Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulillah ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve ala I was saying to uh, uh, Shuaib that I don't come prepared, you know, I make some slides. But these slides almost be the same every time. But I use the slides just to sort of keep attention to people. But I only speak to people, not to chairs. I get inspired f from the audience, right? And so that if I was to see young people, I'll be hopefully speaking to young people. If I'm speaking to Muslims, non-Muslims, and all has to communicate and engage with the, with the people who are listening. So I'm very pleased that you are here. Thank you so much. We're talking obviously about uh, education and, and the, the three characteristics that I'd like to dwell on that's been touched upon a little bit. But one is about balanced education, right? And the other one is about inclusive education. And the third is about sustainable education. The, I'll start with the idea of sustainable. So um, I'd, I'd like to sort of uh, look at the key challenges that you know, everybody's talking about building scientific technological knowledge society. Everywhere you go around the world, Muslim world included, because of the digital world, because of the information technology. And that's the sort of aim. Well, if you uh, look at how you're going to do that, any society, if they want to really build their future, they have the most important asset, and that is the human being the human resources. And you look at examples, for instance, in Japan, Germany, Finland, Singapore, Malaysia, China. These emerging, fast-growing societies competing in the so-called modern world, they have been successful because they have invested in the education of their future generation. And they considered this as being their biggest asset, right? the highest and the most important asset. Singapore, for instance, is one of the very top richest countries in the world. It started with nothing only about 15 years ago. And then they don't have any material uh, commodities as such. They have human beings and they invest in their education. So this is a sort of, <coughs> therefore it tells us that the, if the aspirations of young people resonate with the leadership, things can happen. It, can, it happened with Islam, it happened with many other uh, civilizations and so on. There, there, are, there are facts that cannot be ignored. I was going to tell you about the story of how Germany and how Japan and how Singapore have actually triggered their, their, their young people and how they have had this huge paradigm shift. But we're not going to be doing that because there's no time. Right, so... Uh, Turkey is now engaging. They have a vibrant society emerging. They have a relationship between the young people and their present leadership. They have 60% uh, of their population is young. So it actually, uh, their problem now is how they are motivating and how they can inspire their future generation. The huge problem that we have in this world today and in the future is this. It's a very complex world. It's almost chaotic. You just, you know, it's a cobweb of problems. Wherever you go, there are huge problems that mostly are man-made problems. The man-made problems, anything that human beings make somehow turns out to be faulty, right? Problems everywhere. And they are intermingled with each other. Each one of them influences the other. So how do we propose to bring our future generation to face this very complex world, right? particularly Muslim children. How are we going to do that? Now, the West uh, and modern civilization, they have sort of devised a system which is driven by market forces to get the best out of people. But whilst they are doing so, they started producing wolves, competitive people. Young kid has to be competitive. And the Muslims are also following suit. 
what they do is that most of the Muslim families, as soon as they have fam money, they will put their kids into being educated, right? Private education in what? Maths, chemistry, physics, biology, English, right? So these are the, the subjects so that they can compete in the schools, so they can get high uh, grades and end up with uh, universities. And then, of course, later on, hopefully, they will end up with a job. Now, this competitive spirit, if it's not properly controlled, it actually produces wolves. Selfish individuals. They only care about themselves. And the word I will crop up in almost every other sentence. Me, I, I, right? This type of creature, which is now increasing in number in the world, is, is, is incredible because it has this selfish behavior ingre you know, ing ingrained now from childhood. Even, you know, you end up with a Muslim, yeah, you can do the prayer, you can do the, you know, you know fasting and so on, but what he's be a, he or she will be a Muslim wolf, right? Because you've been trained to compete against other people. The spirit of cooperation, the spirit of forgiveness, the spirit of mercy, the spirit of is, is disappearing, it's gone, right? And their attitude to the, to the environment is even worse. I mean, when you, you go around and find litter everywhere, the way the water is being treated, the way the electricity is being treated, the way this planet is being treated, is just like nobody has any respect, right, to the environment, to the rest of humanity. Why? Because of this competitiveness that has been bred due to the, re re the response to this complex world that you see. Because the thesis at the moment in education in the West, and followed by the rest of the world now, is that in order to face this complex world and complex future, you've got to be a wolf to do so. That is what it is. You've got to fight because there are market forces. Because market forces are the ones that are dominant. Uh, and even universities have been now been raped by market forces, right? They treat the uh, students as, uh, as clients, right? And now we see the educational system in this country is going, converting schools into academies. And I understand that academies probably are almost similar to the polytechnics and colleges of technologies before, and then by a decision from government, they were converted to universities knowing that the universities will be dominated by market forces and therefore the polytechnics and the uh, uh, new universities are called the polytechnics right they became universities and then they will dissolve and they will be ranked as universities and then they say bob goes your uncle the same thing is going to happen in education market forces are the king and they are the god right of this present complex world so how are we going to address that you know, this is a big issue it's not a question of just believing in Allah and believing in the Prophet. This is all very good. The Muslims at the time, they had to respond to the complex problems of their time. They had to generate their response to the Greek philosophy, to the Romans, to the Persians, to the Chinese. They brought up, and this was their response, the response of a believer who has faith, got an example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, but use their brains and their mind to solving those problems for the betterment of society and betterment of humanity and preserving the balance on this earth. Right. So let's look at uh, these. This, this, if you look at any big project, any, even in a school, hospital, building a, you know, uh, any country, building any project, you will find that there are a number of factors that will influence the success of that project. And these factors, <coughs> they are interrelated with each other, right? So if you look at any of those, you have food, you have trade, you have energy, the climate, right? The biosphere, the water, the habitat, the wealth, and the governance, community, the worldview, right? Well-being, all these are interacting with each other. If you change any one of them, it influences the rest. 
You can't do it in isolation. So can you imagine how complex the system is? We are called the blue planet because one of the astronauts from a distance and looked at it, said, oh, he found a little blue ball there and, and he called it, he just measured it in his thumb and he named it as the blue planet. So that's the blue planet. Let's see how do we actually respond to behavior, to how is our behavior, right, engaged with this planet? Just to give you a very simple example. I went to the gents just before coming now. I wanted to fill a little jug of water, right, for use. I pressed the button, which is good actually to save water. It's, I pressed it because it was a good idea so that it doesn't, it doesn't last, uh, that you don't waste water, which is a very early Muslim idea, is to preserve water. And many of the Muslim engineering gadgets in those early years, I can show you some, they actually were built on the idea of water preservation. But the problem in here is that when you pressed it and you let it, it just kept going. <laughs> right. <laughs> the thing is full and then it kept going. So that's wasting of water. That doesn't go along with, 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 with the idea of living in this planet. Now, there was somebody said that, you know, if we were to live like uh, Cubans at the time of Fidel Castro, right? I don't know how will it be now that they are friends with the Americans, right? But at the time of Fidel Castro, if you were living, you know, you might just need one planet from the way they live. If you live like an Australian, you need 3.7 planets to maintain the humanity. Can you imagine how many planets do we need if we live like Texans or the Californians or you know, the Abu Dhabi and, and, and so on? You know, they, they, it's just not enough. The way we are treating our resources are, I would call in my lingo, highly un-Islamic. But of course, when we talk about it in general, it is, it is imbalanced, it's not sustainable. So we are not bringing our children to behave in a sustainable manner. They have to resonate. You know, you go out of the room, you must switch the light off. That's what I do. Even though maybe I am hosted in a very top hotel. It's been almost 10 years since it has left the UK. And it's gone all over the world. China, and, you know, America, and as you've seen, there are a lot of interest in this subject area. Um, I hope that there will be an opportunity to bring it back into the UK so that the, our new generation since 10 years ago will have an opportunity to see this, to, to have experience uh, this exhibition and have an interaction with it. We're trying to get the uh, politicians to agree because they have now a new fear the fear of extremism. They found that long before we hear the word extremism, this project and this kind of approach of bringing out what Muslims and other civilizations have done into the presence so that people begin to appreciate and have an identity and they begin to respect each other. This kind of discovery, right, is now becoming very important to counteract extremism, both sides. Because extremism is not only in, on the deprived and on the one side, extremes normally are two sides. There's one extreme left and one extreme right. And we, Muslims and others, who are sitting in the middle, are being influenced very highly by those two extremes. And this, this project, I hope, will be able to come, but it requires the support of government at the time. It was the Labour government who supported it. And I think now the new government are also interested. There has to be an, a lot of lobbying and pressure from the Muslim community, in particular from the Chinese and Indian communities, because they are also, they are having their uh, heritage uh, airbrushed from the school curriculum. Now, having said that, I started 
talking about uh, the extreme complexity of this world and how to face these problems and how to enable our children and our educational system so that it can be useful, it has good impact, good footprint on this earth. There are issues. If you look at the curriculum 10 years ago when we looked at it at the time, we find that it was imbalanced. Now you guys, families like me, we taught our ch kids, pumping them to become competitive, more like a wolf, to try to compete and get and then celebrate when they are on the top. You know, schools pride themselves in having, you know, top performance. This is how it is, and of course, that's, there's nothing bad with, you know, in this. However, we think, and many people think, that when you teach maths and you teach physics, chemistry and biology, and all these subjects that are supposed to be neutral, we think that they are neutral, but they're not. Now, I, I, I'll, I'll take you on to some very simple example. In those early years, we looked at the textbooks and the popular science books. Not a single mention of a Muslim physicist in the past, or a mathematician, or a chemist, or a biologist. Not a Chinese, not an Indian, only European. And not only modern Europeans are mentioned, you can go and check them in your own books now. Not only those modern ones from the year 1800 and whatever, but even go all the way back to the Greeks. You have the name like Pythagoras, right? You have the name of Archimedes. You have the name of Aristo. You have the name of Plato, and so on. These are, you know, house names. They are in the school every day. And yet, there is a huge jump between those names of the Greek time and the Renaissance time and the modern time. There's a thousand years missing. Now, I'm not saying that this is deliberate or a conspiracy and so on. Let's not talk politics. But that is the fact. There may be genuine reasons for it. The big issue of this, the big issue, the big problem, of this imbalance is that it creates two things from the children who are brought up in this. Two characteristics. To the European child or American child, it breeds in him or her superiority complex. Meaning, they think they are the founders and the establishers of modern civilization. No other culture has contributed to it. For the Indian, the Muslim, and the Chinese, and others, they develop inferiority complex for the same reason. Because they think that none of his cultures or his civilization has had anything to do with building of the modern civilization. So it creates two opposite, very critical, dangerous attitudes. Superiority in on the one hand, inferiority on the other, and it starts from the childhood. It's incredible. Now, how can one resolve this for the future? So what we say, it has to be inclusive. You cannot teach in the future, with the world becoming one village, to avoid extremism, to in fact counter extremism and have a, you must have a narrative in the science subjects as well as the social sciences. It's not sufficient to teach religion or Islam and so on. You make your child hafiz. You think you've done very well. But your child, whether it be a girl or a boy, is got the inferiority complex. He or she inside, inside, they know that the others are better. 
because they come to you, crush into the behavior, into the syllabus. It's everywhere. It's Newton. It's Maxwell. It's this and that. They're all the places. You go out in the streets. You go out in the parks. You go on the names of the hospitals. They're all Western names. European names. Now, that breeds, of course, a nation must be proud of its uh, people. One, there's nothing wrong with it. What we're trying to say is that if you have to celebrate names of physics scholars and you give them Nobel laureates, you might say, you, f you celebrate Newton. If you have to mention names like Newton, na names like Copernicus, names like, well, why don't you mention the names of other people as well? It isn't that they don't exist. There are a lot of Chinese scholars who contributed to mathematics and physics and mechanics and industry. Paper comes from China, right? So, and Indians have contributed a great deal into mathematics. The numerical system that we have, which we call Arabic numerals, the one, two, three, four, we call it Arabic numerals, as against the Latin, L, M, X, X, I, yeah? Thank you. <laughs> right? We call them Arabic numerals. They actually originally come from India. And the Arabs used to call them Indian numerals. But when they came to Europe, the Europeans, because they took them from the Arabs, they called them Arabic numerals. Of course, they have been modified by the Arabs and the Muslims. It is not like the same as they are in the Indian. The, the eastern part of the Muslim world still uses the Indian, but the western part of the Muslim world, like North Africa and so on, they use the, the proper Arabic numerals that have been modified into one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Now, these, they, are, they exist. The name algebra from the book of Al-Jabr wal you know, We are not short of scientists and scholars in the very subjects that we call STEM subjects in our schools. But well, why are they not there? If we really want our kids all to celebrate our country here, like the UK, then we must all be treated equally. We should celebrate humanity together, right? This is a very important issue. And it's got a message that needs to be lobbied. And it, otherwise, we will never solve the problem of extremism. It will never be solved. Because on the one hand, you have a right right extremist and on the other you have possibly a Muslim extremist or an Indian extremist or in the future be a Chinese extremist because as the Chinese now begin to discover their identity and they see that they are they need to have an identity and then they find that they actually they are being excluded from the curriculum of the, the educa you know, education around the world the world curriculum is predominantly Western curriculum and so it breeds this Right? And, and therefore, we have to be as British, as Brits, Muslim, fine, but we're British as well. We've got to be lobbyers of this. It's to save the country. It also will save the world to have an inclusive curriculum. I said earlier, we need to have a curriculum or bring our children to, to, be, to have resonance, to have a feel for the planet, planet Earth its environment, its creatures, its energy, the water, and so on. All that, our children should be exemplar to other people. Because that's what the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to do. When he wanted to use water, he only take a little bit. Even from the river. They say, why don't you just go? He says, no, you take what you need. And the idea of balance, mizan. Everywhere when you find that children were brought up in the Muslim civilization, they were taught the concept of balance, model, middle path, balance, right? So, and then you want to have the idea of inclusivity, which I have just mentioned. Of course, inclusivity is a much bigger uh, concept. I think that uh, I don't want to take long because it's a very long story, in particular the Muslim civilization. And if you look at the contribution in engineering, because I'm a professor of engineering, and when I looked at the history of engineering, I thought it was criminal to have excluded the great designers and engineers of the Muslim civilization and also of the Chinese civilization. We build our modern industry 
on their theories and on their designs and on their work, right? And, and it really is just incredible how is it that I didn't know about it. And I was a professor. I, I was only told about this when a, a colleague, Professor Donald Cardwell, in Humus, he was professor of history of science and technology. He said to me, Salem, what are you going to do with yourself? I said, what do you mean? He said, you're a distinguished professor. You know, you've done very well for yourself. And you are the highest, you're the highest earner for the university. I used to bring a lot of money to my university. You know, with market forces, they love me because I bring money, right? And because I was consultant to oil companies and so on in the North Sea. And so he said, we're going to do it here. So I said, what do you want? What do you mean? He said, well, I tell you what, I have studied history of science all my life. And I find that there is a thousand years missing between the Greeks and the Renaissance. And I said, yes. He said, well, you know, you come from Baghdad. And we see you every now and then going there and you go and do your prayers. So you obviously have a feel for your, your people and your religion and so on. Why don't you do something about it? I said, excuse me, Donald. I hate history. He said, what do you mean you hate history? I said, well, the history that I was taught was history of people killing each other. It was all about wars, what I was taught in Baghdad. You know, and also about differences of one, in one tribe over another, one dynasty. He said, look, the history that you have been taught was history of dynasties and politics. And throughout the world, when it comes to politics and dynasties, there will always be wars because it's about you know, it's about the same thing, about conquest and about authority and about ego and about money. But look at the history of science and look at the lives of these people, the biographies of these, the scientists, and then you come to me. So I, I went, I said, okay, I'll have a, don't want to be biased. I went there and said, I was gobsmacked. I really was gobsmacked. It was so exciting and so interesting. Just to show you as a proof, by the way, at the time, there was a very popular book which claims to be, it says, Scientists and Inventors. That was, I picked it up. It's a big book, right? Still around. And it claims to be, it tells you about the people who made technology from earliest times to the present day. I mean, that's a fantastic thing, isn't it? If I wanted to go and learn about it, and because I didn't know, I thought I better go there and I could find out the history of technology in the world, right? Now look at this. Every two pages, every two pages of this book is about an inventor or a famous scientist, right? So you carry on from long time in the history and then you reach Archimedes in the year 212 BC, right? You reach there. Now, this is page 14. That means there's 14 and 15 about Archimedes. The next, next one, this is no joke. The year 1400. And it starts with Gutenberg. Where is the rest? The thousands of others coming on afterward. That is the story of what they call Dark Ages, or Medieval Ages, or the Middle Ages. Middle between what? What do we mean middle between what? What they mean is between the Greeks and the Renaissance. That's what the Middle Ages mean. You are teachers, you let me know. I don't know what you, t what you mean by Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, or Medieval period. That's what is meant between two civilizations. And those are the two civilizations. So this is the, this is the crux. And, and then you go on to Leonardo da Vinci. The summary of our research, whether it be books of physics or chemistry or maths, biology, any of those books, they fall into this graph. You get the names out of the people mentioned from the index and the subjects, you know, like the names of equations, right? Boyle's law, right? Maxwell's law, all, take all these. They will find, they will fit in in this graph. What it should be taught is something like that. We include humanity in there. What's wrong with this? 
it only takes few names here and there to show some recognition. And so our kids will find it. They find themselves there. They begin to identify with you. They will be they realize that somebody is appreciating what my grand grand ancestors have done. So it isn't only Newton. You bring in the subject. You bring in Hassan ibn al Haytham. When Newton said, "I, I, if uh, I, uh, if I saw more than others, it was because I was standing on the shoulders of giants." Well, who are these giants? Because when you look at the books that you are teaching in the physics, and when where it mentions Newton. There are no giants there. They just disappear. And so uh, we have the Indians, we have the Chinese, and we have the Persians. We also have other civilizations, the Mayan and others. They need to be recognized. If they are there, we mention them. So I picked up here, just you can't read it. There are about uh, uh, sort of uh, 400 names, 500 names. And if they were alive here today, they're men and women right christian as well because muslim civilization embraced christians and jewish scholars and sabians and so on and they would have straight away they would get they become members of the fellows of the royal society because of their substantial contribution and if you select i selected 40 of those the names are a bit uh, confused here again including two women there maria malajli and sutayt al-baghdadi who is a great mathematician uh, they would be probably given Nobel Prize right? if the Nobel Prize committee was not biased. I was going to show you a lot of uh, hopes. <laughs> that was one of, one of the inventions of Al Jazeera. He has invented these gearing systems so that he can maximize the number of water uh, scoops that come out. He has also been known to have converted the a, a suction, uh, this is a suction pump, which converts rotary motion into linear motion. We don't know about that in school. When you do this in the schools and you make an experiment and the kids start making it and play, they love it. It doesn't have to be a Muslim, but it's something that is really enjoyable. And you do it and do all the maths, all the calculations, all the mechanics, they're all there. You can, and this, by the way, the manuscripts are on the side. This is not, you know, they have taken all this information from the manuscripts and then converted them into engineering drawings because I am engineer, right? That's why I've been interested in this. But equally, mathematicians will probably be able to do the same. Chemists will be able to do the same as I did, to go and look at the proper history of, 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 of their subject. And, and you see, that one that you've just seen, this one here is almost like a six-cylinder engine car. In the, in, 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 in the year of 1556 by Taqiyuddin in Istanbul, you know, it's incredible. It's a six-cylinder pump with the connecting rods, with the camshaft and everything. And don't want to be too technical. Um, there is this ele elephant clock, which is amazing. You know, it recognizes the guy in 1206 by the name of Jezerian from south of Turkey, right? And he, makes, he made this clock to celebrate effectively the contributions of humanity. He, re he uses a Chinese... Uh, uh, serpent, right? He uses the bird on the top, which was the symbol of the pharaonic civilization, right? The, the, the phoenix. He uses uh, a Persian Afghan carpet. He uses an elephant to celebrate India, right? And then he uses uh, uh, Muslims, you know, who are effectively with the turbans and so on to recognize the present civilization. And so, you know, there are qu qu quite a number of them mentioned. This is a, this is, if you like, a timing clock, which can, you can, you can time it to give you alarm and so on. The, um, and, and quite a number of time machines and timing clocks, some of them, gen all of them generate music. Uh, uh, to, uh, to, to. And then you've got uh, fascinating control mechanisms and you know things that can actually play music and so on machines this one here is the best now then that clock we've spent 
a lot of time to find out its details from manuscripts, from descriptions. And it's the clock that Harun al-Rashid, the Caliph of Baghdad, the famous 1001 Nights, right, has given to Charlemagne in Europe a gift, right? That gift in the year 801, can you imagine? When Baghdad was in its, in its peak and sending a present like that to Charlemagne. Now the franchise, the Frankine, uh, the Franken uh, archives, they say when this clock arrived and it was set up and operated, people ran away, you know, including him. They thought there was a genie inside. How can this thing work like that? <laughs> right? With sound and then every now and then there is a horseman coming out. You know, it was really fascinating. And we've discovered the secret in how it worked. In fact, one of the persons who described it very thoroughly is the famous Imam Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, right? He has got a, a, a book which speaks about uh, uh, the, the explaining that there's nothing by chance and he tried to explain like the domino effect, one cause after another. He described the clock, this clock, how one event triggers another event, another event, another event, and he, we discovered it there. But of course, we took a lot of the information from the uh, French archive. This is uh, another clock which is done by Taqidir. There are the really amazing things. Speaking earlier, I was talking about the environment. This is a, a wuzu making machine. It's, it's about one meter high. You bring it to your guest, right? The guest is sitting, and then all the guest has to do is to hit the beak, the head of the peacock. And then it starts giving you water. One, and then goes back. Second, it goes back. Third, it knows how many times you need it to wash your hands, to wash your face, your arms, right? <coughs> to do the ablution, to do wudu. And then when it finishes, it clicks, goes around and gives you a towel. I know we're trying to preserve water in this uh, mosque, which is very good about the button that, you know, you press the button and you only get one little bit, that's very good. But some of them don't work. Congratulations, it was a good effort, but it has to be maintained, right? Make sure that every one of them works properly. So that, this, this, this is fascinating. And also the care, this is how it works actually, it's very much like the, 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 the toilet flush, but it works repetitively. I don't want to go into the system anyway. Uh, in details. This is a, a, a water feeding, water to feed the animals. Can you imagine? It's to feed the animals, an automatic machine. More than a thousand years ago, it was spread around so that when the animal comes around, it's, as it stands on the, next to the machine, it opens a, uh, a valve and then this, this machine starts working. The idea that this machine is, uh, it, it sort of, uh, it makes sure that uh, that the water level always stays the same, so that when animal comes and takes the water, right, the other one comes still find the same level. But it is such an intelligent machine, it can, if it finds that there is a cow or a horse, takes a lot more water than supposed to, it stops. You know, this is incredible. Really, it's intelligent, it's care, it's, you know, for the environment. Anyway, let's now, I think that's what I wanted to say. Uh, we've had uh, enormous success with the UNESCO and we've partnered with the UNESCO going around the world, right, with the, with the recognition of uh, Al Hassan ibn al Haytham. Right, as, as he's now right, recognized. I must say, I must commend the present government that for the first time in the history of curriculum, that they have introduced Al Hassan ibn al Haytham. Right, that can be mentioned in the curriculum. This is a great achievement, and I feel that this is now uh, the beginning, and uh, Muslims and non-Muslims should avail that opportunity. Yeah, so, the, uh, ah, I wanted to mention to you about this, how, how, how recognition and appreciation. This is Ibn al-Haytham's exhibition in Beijing as part of the Festival of Science in Beijing. One million visitors. You know what the Chinese have done? They have used Ibn al-Haytham, this pyramid here, as the mass talk of the festival. 
Must, you know, must. It's the prime exhibit, the prime project. Ibn al Haytham must congratulate the Chinese for that, to be able to recognize, right, to recognize Ibn al Haytham as the father of modern science, modern, modern optics. This is really great. Can you imagine this is like, you know, America puts something in, in front of the White House, which is Ibn al Haytham there? Would, it, would that be possible? Would, it, would you be able to do this in London? This is something that is now, the world is moving towards appreciation, towards recognition. Now the gentleman, the, he, he's not here, our South African Imam who read early in the morning, he read a very nice verse, which is, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuha nas inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa unta. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُرُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارُفُوا إِنَّ أَكَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْخَاكُمْ I have consulted 12 translations of this verse in English. None of them got it right. Why? Because like you and me, we used to think, Allah says in the Quran in this verse, we have created you from male and female, right? 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 and made you into peoples and tribes so that you may know each other. Is that right? That's what you get translation. That's not correct. Because it doesn't say لِتَعْرَفُوا It says لِتَعَارَفُوا تَعَارَفُوا This has got this long thing which is actually means so that you appreciate each other. What is the use of knowing? Well, this nice lady there is covering her face, right? She's niqab. So what? Uh, doesn't mean anything, really. This fellow is black, this fellow is white, he's a Jew and so on. Doesn't mean anything. But appreciation does. Because in appreciation, you look for the good things in that, in that in, in individual. When you introduced me, you made a big thing out of that earlier in the morning. He is this, he is that, he is that, right? You make me feel blushing. People like to be appreciated. This is nothing against Islam. People like appreciation. Like individuals, also tribes and peoples. Allah created us so that we may appreciate each other. Appreciate diversity. You appreciate diversity. You don't make diversity as being to sort of you go up above, above other people. And, and that's why the last of the verse, right? That inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum, the most, the most high, the most revered person, the nearest person in distinction to Allah, is the one who is says atqakum. It means the one who is most conscious of God, right? Conscious of God, feel that Allah exists and feel near to Allah. That's what taqwa means. So the question really here is balance. We want inclusivity and we want sustainable education so that it can always continue to grow with the problems of the world. I say this, thank you for inviting me. I hope it has aroused some interesting things in your mind. Thank you so much. May Allah uh, embrace you with barakah.